remember I was giving you the um, the derivation and such of what quaint means. But he then goes on and says, he talks about your quaint honor will turn to dust and into ashes all my lust. Now lust is what kind of thing? Desire. Desire, okay. That's a, that's a paraphrase, if you want, or a restating of lust. I mean, what kind of thing? Animal, mineral, vegetable kind of thing. It's a concept, right? It's not material. It's not physical. So how could something immaterial, something not physical, turn into ashes? Now, obviously, it's a metaphor. Okay, But I think he also, because quaint means something, I think he wants us to think of his penis instead of lust. Okay, So just as her quaint honor will turn to what? Will turn to dust, his lust will turn to ashes. And then you get one of the greatest couplets in English literature. The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do their embrace. This is on 8.15. So, we've had the first two stanzas where he's kind of saying premise, premise, conclusion. Now, therefore. Remember, the first one begins, had we but world enough in time. The second one says, but at my back I always hear. Third one, now. We don't have the world. We don't have all the time. Now. Now what? Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore of winds and fires, now let us sport us while we may. And now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour <clears throat> than languish in his slow-chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball and tear our pleasures with rust strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. So, if we had all the time in the world, you could play hard to get as long as you wanted. And I would still pursue you. Okay? But, time's, time's running. So now, what should we do? Now, notice what he says. While the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew. Youthful hue, that nice, beautiful complexion that you have. As a young lady, I don't know, in her teens or early 20s, let's say. How does that hue, how does that complexion sit on her face? Like morning dew. What happens to the dew? In the morning, he just mouthed it after the sun starts to rise, it evaporates. What's going to happen to her complexion as the sun rises, as she gets older and older and older? And while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, what's the speaker saying? Her willing soul, her soul desires. Okay. Now, let us sport while we may. Sport means what? He's not talking, hey baby, let's go play football. He means what? The word that came before football. Let's play. Let's play. While we may. And like Amherst, what in the world is he talking about? Birds of prey. Kites, falcons, kestrels, hawks, eagles. While they, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chapped power. How do birds of prey devour time? And notice you have no footnote, which is a problem with anthologies like this. Well, it was a commonplace that it was a widely held belief during the Renaissance that birds of prey would mate by flying way up in the high, way up in the sky, and then the male would mount the female and they would just fall. 
wouldn't flap their wings, wouldn't soar, they'd just fall. And she'd be going, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Okay? That's how they're devouring time, because they're seeing it rush past them. Rather than languish in times, what? Slow, chapped power. Slow, chapped means very slowly eating. What does time do to everything? Destroys it. Destroys it. It wears everything down. So he's saying, let's, let's use our time. Let's, let's make time really work for us rather than let it work on us. All right? Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball. And I think he kind of means there, let's get all entangled. So that you cannot tell male from female. And do what? And tear our pleasures with rough strife. No, I'm actually I'd see to say, well, this guy's into S and M, you know. No, he's not into S and M. He's not some weird kinky. She's not a dominatrix. He's a... no. Let's roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Nobody really knows what that line means. Through the iron gates of life. One version of the poem reads through the iron grates of life. Okay. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, possibly in allusion to Joshua praying to the Lord, and the Lord makes the son stand still so that he can destroy I, yet we will make him run. That is... We're going to be so busy, we're going to tire time out. Okay? That's why I said, this and to the virgins to make much of time are the two greatest carpe diem poems in the English language. I mean, they're so clear, you better use your time while you can. Okay? From there, page 816, because we're still doing terms. An illusion. Well, I've used that term several times. What is it? A brief cultural reference to a person, place, thing, event, or idea in the history of literature. But it's not just in the history of literature. An allusion doesn't have to be to something else in literature. It can be something else in history. Like if I were to say, you know, I don't know, pick a person. Uh, I'll, I'll use a, a silly allusion. Jim Mattis is a Benedict Arnold. Jim Mattis, Secretary of Defense, you know, highly decorated Marine General, Benedict Arnold. Who's that? Traitor. I mean, you don't have to say anything else. Traitor. Okay? That's an allusion to something back before. So that when, I don't remember who it was, some actor said several months ago, you know, it's too bad we don't have a John Wilkes Booth around today. What was the person saying? We need somebody to assassinate the president. Okay? So, that's an illusion. Let's go on a little bit more uh, to chapter 25, page 841. Images. Any language that addresses the senses. We kind of think images means what? Visual image. Okay. But in literary terms, it's anything that addresses the senses. So, barn burning, that opening paragraph. Okay. What do the images okay, of the fish on the can mean to Sardi? Hunger, that's a sensory thing, okay? So images can be colors, images can be sounds, images can be smells, they can be tastes, etc. Usually they're visual, however, okay? So look at... 
Look at the little poem on page 842. William Carlos Williams writes a whole bunch of poems just like this. Here's another one in your book. I marked it the other day. The only problem is I don't remember where I marked it. That's so too far. Um, called The Red Wheelbarrow. This one's just titled Poem. As the cat climbed over the top of the jam closet, first the right forefoot carefully, then the hind stepped down into the pit of the empty flower pot. The entire poem is what? An image. Because you just saw in your mind that cat climbing over right foot first, and then it ends up inside a red clay flower pot. What's the poem mean? Exactly what it is. The image. That's all it means. Um, the other poem that I was thinking of page you don't have to look it up. Just listen to this one. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So much, what depends? I don't know. But now you've got the image in your mind of a red wheelbarrow glistening with rainwater and white chickens beside it. And that image will probably stick with you for quite a while, okay? Um, should I do that one now? No, I can't do that one now because I don't have the copy I need for you. Page, uh, chapter 26, Figures of Speech, page 865. You all know what a figure of speech is, even though you may not know the quote-unquote textbook definition, because you use them all the time, okay? A way of saying one thing in terms of something else. They're designed to do what? To clarify, not obscure, our understanding of what they describe. So for example, an overeager funeral director might, for example, be described as a vulture. Why a vulture? What do vultures do? They eat the dead. They take care of, you know, the dead, etc. Okay? So, there's a bunch of different kinds of figures of speech. Page 867. Simile and metaphor. You all learned this, you know, a dozen years ago. Simile is what? Comparison of things using like, as, and several other kinds of words. Than, appears, seems, okay? A metaphor is a comparison that doesn't use one of those comparative words. So, he runs like a tiger. He is a tiger. Notice the difference. Like gives you, tells you, here's the person, here's the tiger, kind of arrow pointing towards. He is a tiger, person, tiger, equal sign. Now, he is a tiger, is different than he runs like a tiger, right? Because he runs like a tiger is narrowing it down. He is a tiger can mean a whole lot of different things. He's ravenous. He's dangerous. Right? So, look at the little poem by Margaret Atwood. I love this poem. It's so disgusting. <laughs> you fit into me like a hook into an eye. A fish hook. An open eye. Because hook into eye can refer to what? Most of the men here won't be familiar with this, but some of you women will. A dress that has a hook and a little eye on the back. You put the hook into it, okay, to fasten it. Or if you have a necklace, okay, the necklace might have a hook and eye. So you fit into me like a hook into an eye is what? A very fitting image. 
The I exists, that particular kind of I, exists for the purpose of a hook. And then you get the second stanza, a fish hook, an open eye. No, no, those two things don't go together. Okay, that's extremely painful. Metaphor makes a comparison, okay, without. And so you have a whole bunch of examples there. Okay. Some metaphors, page 868, more subtle than others because their comparison of terms is less explicit. For example, he brayed his refusal to live. That is, the verb implies. Okay? Or he hounded her. That's implying the, spe the, the he is like a dog okay? because of the verb that's used. So it's implied, it's not an explicit metaphor. You have extended metaphors, controlling metaphors. Page 869. An extended metaphor, the one that's being referred to in the poem Catch that we didn't talk about, compares poetry to a game of catch. How so? The entire poem is based around that um, comparison. Turn to that poem real quickly. On page 762. Two boys and coach are tossing every hand, teasing with attitudes, latitudes, interludes, attitudes, altitudes. High, make him fly off the ground for it. Low, make him stoop. Make him scoop it up. Make him as almost as possible miss it. Fast, let him stink from it. Now, now, fool him slowly. Anything, everything tricky, risky, nonchalant. Right? Because if you ever played catch, do you want the ball thrown exactly straight to you? Do you want it thrown, you know, underhand so it's really easy? No, because you're working on your catching abilities. So you want to high it out, down low. The poem does the same. Anything under the sun to outwit the prosy. The prosy means the everyday, the ordinary, the commonplace. Over the tree in the long sweet cadence down, over his head, make him scramble to pick up the meaning. And now, like a posy, a pretty one plump in his hands, and then you get a paraphrase. Poet's relationship to a reader is similar to a game of catch. A poem, like a ball, should be pitched a variety of ways. In other words, it shouldn't be easy. Okay? Go back to where we were. A poem that does that, or a metaphor that, that works that way throughout the entire poem, it's called a controlling metaphor. Anne Bradstreet, the author to her, book, to her book. Okay, Anne Bradstreet is the first American poet because she's the first published American poet. Right? 17th century. The poem is titled The Author to Her Book. So she's talking to her book. How does she describe her book? That's the controlling metaphor. The book is like a child. Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain. Now let me back up for a moment and give you the context. Her brother-in-law took a manuscript of her poems from her home and published it without her knowledge. Okay. That is, before, she says in this poem, they were ready to be published. Some of the poems were maybe first draft. She hadn't gone through revised and such. So, thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, I wasn't ready for you to go out, who after birth did by my side remain. That is, after I wrote these poems, I stuck them in a desk drawer. They remained with me. Ill snatched from thence by friends less wise than true. Well, how could the friend be true, though less wise? He thought he was doing a good thing for her. He thought these deserved being publication. Less wise, because he didn't ask. All right? Who the abroad exposed to public view. Abroad? Outside my house. He exposed these, because now everybody can read them. Made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge. 
where errors were not lessened, all may judge. Rags, talking about what the paper is made of. This isn't wood pulp paper. It's cotton fiber paper. All right? Where errors notice were not lessened. Pretty common in early printing history for someone who is setting up the print on a printing press to make errors. That's why we have the phrase, mind your P's and Q's. Because what's the difference between a P and a Q? The way the bowl is faced and the little thing off the bottom. Because that little serif off the bottom often broke off on a piece of print or type. Okay? Where errors were not lessened, all may judge. At thy return, my blushing was not small. That is, when he came and presented me with this book of my poems, I was embarrassed. Why? My rambling brat in print, should mother call him. The Tenth Muse and Bradstreet. The rambling brat is the book. It called me mother because it has my name on it. I cast thee by as one unfit for life. I took you and I put you in a drawer. Thy visage was so irksome in my sight. Yet being mine own, at length affection would thy blemishes amend, if so I could. After a while, I pulled you back out to do what? Fix them. Make them better. I washed thy face, but more defects I saw. Have you ever taken an exam and you break out an eraser because you've just realized you really messed up and you erase and erase and erase and erase until the paper rips? Been there, done that. That's what she means. Okay. I washed thy face, but more defects I saw and rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. I stretched thy joints to make thee even feet we haven't talked about meter yet, but even feet is the number of syllables in a line. Em and pentameter, 10 syllables. Nine syllables is an uneven line. So she went through and added syllables to make them correct or removed one. Yet still thou runst more hobbling than is meet, that is, that is appropriate. In better dress to trim thee was my mind, but not save homespun cloth in the house I find. Better dress to make you appear better to others. But she says, all I have is homespun cloth. Again, talking about the poems like children. Sorry, Johnny, all I have to dress you in is homespun cloth, not the nice expensive cloth I can buy from somewhere else. But what else does she mean by homespun cloth? Anne Bradstreet writes pretty much about one area of life, the family. That's it. Her husband, her children, her house, her livestock. That's pretty much it. All right? That's homespun stuff. She's not talking about the great ideas, beauty, truth, justice, you know, love. So, in this array that is in this clothing, amongst vulgars, mayst thou roam. In critics' hands, beware thou dost not come. In other words, it's okay for you to go among the common, ordinary people. But don't find your way into the hands of literary critics. Because what will they do? They will rip you apart. Take thy way where yet thou art not known. If for thy father asked, say thou hadst none. Ah, they're bastard children. No. And for thy mother, she alas is poor, which caused for thus to send thee out of the door. The reason she takes them, revises them, and sends them back out is what? Money. Because her brother-in-law was able to publish them and sell them, she realizes, I, I can make some money doing this. Okay? 
Notice how the metaphor of the poems is children. It goes entirely throughout the poem. All right. Uh, page 871, you've got pun, play on words, re relies on a word having more than one meaning or sounding like another word. Shakespeare never met a pun he didn't like. He, if he can pun on a word, he will. Okay. The quaint honor in To His Quay Mistress, Marvell is, pun is punning on the word quaint there. Okay, because he understands what the older meaning is. Um, do I want to do those or not? No, we'll skip those. Page 873, personification. We've talked about giving human characteristics to non-human non -human things, like um, good man is hard to find, the dark woods, gaping mouth, right? Apostrophe, addressed to someone who is absent, therefore cannot hear the speaker, or to something non-human. Okay. Next page, overstatement and hyperbole. We don't need to talk about it. You all know what that is. Understatement, where you say less than is intended. The gray is a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. How is that understatement? Well, duh. That's how it's understatement. Okay. Paradox and oxymoron. Paradox is a statement that looks to be self-contradictory. But when you look at it much closer, you kind of go, oh, I get it. That makes sense. An oxymoron is an even severer form of paradox. And you got a couple examples there. Sweet sorrow, silent cream, um, virgin mother. Cold fire. And so you get the little poem by J. Patrick Lewis. The reason this is a, both paradoxical and oxymoronic is its truth. Knives can harm you, heaven forbid. Axes may disarm you, kid. Guillotines are painful, but there's nothing like a paper cut. Think about that. How many of you have ever had a really bad paper cut? It just hurts like hell. Guillotine, yeah, it kills you, but does it hurt? No, it's, you're dead. Okay. Go to symbol and allegory. Chapter 27, pages 888-89. Symbol we've talked about. Okay. Notice top of 889. The meanings suggested by a symbol are determined by its context, how it is used in that poem. So, look at Robert Frost's Acquainted with the Night. This is a poem that's on syllabus for later, so we'll just go ahead and do it now. Remember, images, symbols can be anything. Symbols can be anything that possibly suggests something else. I have been one acquainted with the night. Short declarative sentence. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. I have outwalked the furthest city light. I have looked down the saddest city lane. I have passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes, unwilling to complain, excuse me, to explain. I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street, but not to call me back or say goodbye. And further still, at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been one acquainted with the night. So, what are some possible symbols? I'm not asking you what are they symbolic of. But what are some words that are possibly used symbolically in that poem? Rain. Louder? Rain. Rain? What else? Night? Light? Light? 
Lane, Watchman. Okay. Go back to the first stanza and notice how the stanzas work. The first stanza has three complete sentences. Each line ends with a period. It's just three statements. I have been one acquainted with the night. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. I have outwalked the furthest city light. Okay. Now, literally, that means what? I have been one acquainted. That tense okay, begins in the past and continues to the present. That is, it is ongoing. It's not, I once was acquainted with the night. Okay. It's, I was and I still am. All right. What does acquainted mean? Familiar with? Is an acquaintance a friend? Not really. It's someone you know, you've run into a few times. So I have been one who has run into a few times with the night, who has met the night. So what's the night? Is it literally the dark after day? I have out, I have walked out in rain and back in rain. Now literally, rain is rain. Okay? But could it be more? I have out walked the furthest city light. What's the furthest city light? Notice you can't do this in Murfreesboro or Nashville. You can do it in somewhere like Woodbury, okay, or Arrington, or Triune, where you can leave your door and you can walk out and you can go past the last streetlight. That's what he's talking about. I have left my house, wherever I live, and I have walked past the last light of the city. Okay. Next stanza. I have looked down the saddest city lane. Well, saddest is symbolic, isn't it? I mean, that conjures up various images. I have passed by, who's the watchman? What's another word that we would use for watchman? Cop. I have walked by the cop. I have passed the cop on his beat. Back when cops walked, small towns, a city beat. Or large towns where they have various, you know, precincts and such. And dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. Why dropped his eyes? Unwilling to explain what? Why he's walking around at night? Because is that normal? Not for most people. To walk down the Santa City Lane and to go past the further city line, the implication is what? Are these short five, ten minute walks? No, this guy's walking for a long time. Why? Why the long walks? Why does he drop his eyes unwilling to explain? I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet. Stopped the sound of whose feet? The walker's feet. Why does he stand still? When far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street, comma. Walking on along, he hears a voice and stops. For what purpose? We don't know until we get to the next stanza but not to call me back or say goodbye. What does that introduce to the poem? He's walking. He hears a voice cry out. It goes on. What's the import of to not call me back or say goodbye? Did the person leave in anger? 
in a fit of pique, that is, in frustration, was the person that was being left, the one that he hoped was calling him back, saying, I'm sorry. And further still, at an unearthly light, one luminary clock against the sky. What is that? The moon. It's the moon. One luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. The time for what? What do we associate with the moon? What word that we, that we use to describe a class of individuals is related to the Latin word for moon? You know, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, sorry for those of you who think it was all a hoax, landed on the moon, what did they descend on? It was called the lunar lander. What word is related to lunar? Lunatic. Lunatic. That's one who is loony. Lunacy. Lunacy means what? The moon has a strong pull on you. And I know we kind of tend to think it's, you know, it's, um, what's the phrase? An urban legend. But it's not. My brother used to be a 9-11 um, dispatcher. My brother-in-law used to be a cop for 25 years. They both said they hated full moons because full moon, oh, hell breaks loose. People just go bet you know what crazy for some reason, okay? So one luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time is neither wrong nor right. I have been one acquainted with. Now, what do we often acquaint with the night? Death? Darkness? What's accompanied, what often accompanies both of those? What sometimes leads to death from darkness? Depression? Is acquainted with the night talking about depression? Lunatics often, not all the time, but often do what? People who are deeply, darkly depressed. I mean, when they're depressed, they talk about being where? In a dark place. Just Facebook group I'm on, woodworking group. Guy talked about, did this little four minute, you know, just wanted to tell people. There's 31,000 people in this group from all over the world. And he's just like, just want to let everybody know why I've been, haven't been posting for a while, you know, wife cheated on me, left, etc., and I was in a really dark place. <laughs> but he talked about having, you know, come back to the light a little bit. But those who don't come back to the light do what? Suicide. Okay. Now this poem has had a lot of readings given to it. But the kind of the number one is that he's talking about, at the very least, suicidal <coughs> thoughts. I have been one acquainted with the night. Why does he want to talk to the cop? Well, at the time the poem is written, suicide is against the law. You know, wrap your mind around that. You try to kill yourself, no, just try. Well, we're going to arrest you. No, they won't kill you. It's not a capital crime, okay? Because then you get what you want, okay? So there's a lot of symbolism there, okay? Next page. you got conventional symbols and literary or contextual symbols, okay? Such as roses for love, okay, for a conventional symbol. Literary contextual symbols. The night, for example, by its context can mean one thing. The sun, by its context, can mean one thing. Allegory, top of 891, and didactic poetry. Allegory, 
where you have a symbol that cannot mean multiple things. I know my definition's you know, varying a little bit from this. The symbol has only one referent. So, for example, the greatest allegory in the English language, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. You have a main character named Christian. Christian never stands for Jew. A Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu or atheist or any other ist or u or religious or non-religious belief. It always and only represents one who holds to the Christian faith. Okay? There's a poem written uh, I don't know, 70, 80 years before that called The Fairy Queen that has in the first book of the poem a guy called the Red Cross Knight. He has a shield with a great big giant red cross on it. He always and only represents the Christian ideal of the knight. Okay? You read something by Stephen King, and you don't get allegory. Because King has characters that can represent good positive people, or they can be dark hidden people. You know, The gunslinger in um, the Dark Tower series, Roland, he... he kind of moves around in terms of what he represents. Okay, 893, irony. Discrepancy between what appears to be and what's actually true. Look at this little po poem, Richard Corey, by Edwin Arlington Robinson. Talk about ironic. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from the soul of the crown, clean favor. And imperially slim. Okay, who are the wee people on the pavement? Homeless. Bums, as they would have been called then. Hobos. Okay? So, when he comes into town, we look at him, we go, damn, I wish I could be like that. And he was always quietly arrayed, that is, dressed. And he was always human when he talked. But still he fluttered pulses when he said good morning, and he glittered when he walked. This guy just looks fantastic. And he was rich. He has richer than a king. And admirably schooled in every grace. And fine, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. Okay? He's got all the social graces. He knows how to talk. He knows how to sing. He knows how to address people. So on we worked and waited for the light and went without the meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. Why is that ironic? We want to, no, we don't really want to be like him. Why? Because he's one acquainted with the night. Right? So you have the different kinds, situational and verbal irony mentioned there. Let's go from there to sounds. We're not going to spend a long time on sounds. You get two different kinds of ballads mentioned at top of 917. Go over those. We'll talk about Scarborough Fair later. Um, onomatopoeia, you all know what that is, or you should have, because you probably learned about it in grade school. You know, words that sound like what they mean, buzz, quack, rattle, bang, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But then you have alliteration, assonance, euphony, cacophony, and rhyme comes up. Alliteration, repetition of the same consonant sound at the beginnings of nearby words. People like to use alliteration to emphasize an idea. That is, they won't begin every sound with that alliterative consonant, but they'll use some. Assonance, repetition of the same vowel sound in nearby sounds. Okay. Notice that doesn't have to be at the beginning of a word. You've got several examples there. Sleep, tree, time, tide, haunt, awesome, etc. Euphony, it's when the line is musically or is pleasing to the ear. 
Cacophony is like this. It jangles. It doesn't sound, it don't sound no good. That would be an example of cacophony, okay? Rhyme, page 924. Two or more words or phrases that repeat the same sound. Tappy snappy. Hippy tippy. I rhyme. I rhyme is where they're spelled the same, but they don't sound the same, like these two. And then we can throw in a few others. Take my history of the English language class. There's one more. Through, bow, cough, though, enough. Okay. The reason we have this same spelling, all these different sounds, because of the influence of French in the Middle Ages. Originally, they're all very, very different. Okay? So, I rhyme spellings that look the same, though they don't sound the same. And you have a big example, and we'll stop with this, of um, a lot of sounds rhyme a 925 and 26 with the extract of the poem, The Cataract of Lador. Okay, I'll let you know, like I said, um, if we won't have class Friday, I'm really leaning towards that way. If you want to influence me, you know, checks and cash can be. Yeah. <laughs>